This is the Cato Daily Podcast for Monday, June 1st, 2020. I'm Caleb Brown. When does protest work? When do mass protest movements get you what you want? In response to the recent killings of Breonna Taylor in Louisville and George Floyd in Minneapolis, both at the hands of police, how should protesters conduct themselves for maximum impact to end police abuse? Sociologist Fabio Rojas has studied protest movements. We spoke today. I am in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, a lot of the protests around the country are nominally about uh, Mr. George Floyd in Louisville. It's very different. Uh, almost The focus is largely on uh, Breonna Taylor, who was killed by uh, police a couple of months ago in her home at night, shot eight times. And as far as I know, she was not suspected of any crime. That's where the protests are here. And it's it's very unfortunate to uh, watch a lot of the sort of degradation of what you would hope a protest would look like. That is, police largely being uh, respectful of people exercising their right to, in a sense, petition the government for a redress of grievances about the manner in which they have been uh, treated or individuals within their communities have been treated. You imagine that protesters will understand we're here to ask for something, but quite often, in fact, very often, that's not the way this interaction between police and protesters ultimately goes. Give me your general sense about what we have seen in political protest, uh, what you in particular have seen uh, within political protests and, and how they are regarded, not just by the police who are meant to protect and serve these people exer- exercising their rights to to voice themselves but also like the broader uh how communities look at protest i think it really helps to think about the bill of rights and the first amendment which says that people have a right to assemble and when the bill of rights was written they didn't just have sports events or music events in mind they had political events in mind And one of the basic insights of the Bill of Rights is that people do have the right to protest. Assembly is just another word for gathering people together. It could be for a personal reason, a social reason, but also political reasons, right? This is why the Bill of Rights says you have the right to petition government, right? You have a right to uh, put out your grievance and to be heard. And so throughout American political history, we've always recognized uh, as a community that people have the right to protest. However, uh, over time, uh, the relationship between protesters and activists and the rest of society has changed. Um, When I was writing my book on the anti-Iraq war movement of the 2000s, I attended dozens, maybe even more protests uh, all over the country in San Francisco, Chicago, Washington, D.C., and other places uh, that I'm probably losing track of. And one thing that I found very remarkable was how organized and how uh, well established the uh, detente between police departments and protesters was. Uh, In other words, when you uh, went to, say, an anti-Iraq war protest in 2005, or not 2005, but say 2005 or 2006, one thing that you quickly noticed is that um, uh, the police were there, they knew about the protest, they were prepared for it, the activists who staged the protest often notified the police department, uh, there have been previous periods of time where the police had acted very badly, to be blunt, and there have been uh, court cases and negotiations uh, between activists and uh, police departments to make sure that when a protest happened and the police showed up, that uh, things were going to be orderly in general, uh, and that the police would be restrained and the protesters would be restrained, and whatever arrests happened would be pretty rare. Uh, would be pretty rare events, and most people could express their grievance uh, peacefully. And one of the things uh, that's different about what happened with the uh, recent protests in Minneapolis about George Floyd is that um, a lot of police departments have seemed to have abandoned this uh, uh, mutual understanding. Uh, We're in the middle of it right now. Protests are happening right now. So we don't know why exactly these previous rules of engagement for police have broken down. Um, that's going to be a, a point of serious discussion uh, in the coming weeks. Uh, but in general, I think Americans, most Americans are very comfortable with the idea that you're allowed to go 
downtown and you can hold a sign. You're allowed to criticize the police. Nobody's above the law. You're allowed to critique. And uh, that freedom of speech, that freedom of assembly, that freedom of petition has been there since the Bill of Rights. And I think most Americans would respect it today. And I think a serious question we all have to all ask ourselves is, why is that broken down in this wave of protests? So uh, one key difference between protests of the Iraq war and protests that are going on right now is the fact that uh, the protests are, in a sense, against particular members of police forces themselves. Yeah, that's absolutely correct that, you know, um, the stakes are a little bit different when people are saying you're the bad guy rather than George Bush or Obama being the bad guy. Um, and so that's one very complicated issue that uh, activists have to resolve, which is when you're uh, protesting the people who are there to ensure public order and to uh, enforce the law, and you're critiquing them and you're saying you're doing a bad job. And frankly, that is the uh, criticism that's been levied. They've said, you're failing at your mission. Uh, you know, when somebody uh, dies in police custody, uh, they sh and they should be safe. You're, you're failing at your mission. When somebody dies during a police stop, you're failing at your mission. So emotions may be higher than in other protests. Maybe it's the case that activists have not contacted police departments. I seriously doubt that because most of the time, large protests are almost always arranged beforehand. Uh, the real, even something that looks spontaneous is usually uh, done with some level of organization. Activists may call a police department or may notify people before a call goes out, even if it's an, a couple hours later. Uh, but when you're the subject of criticism, your emotions may really get out of control and people's um, caution may be thrown to the wind in some cases. Okay. So uh, when it comes to what, it's not inevitable, but it, it's, it sometimes seems that way, that these things break down that bad actors on both sides then are able to essentially capture public attention. And for, for people watching, they're going to be more attuned to the bad behavior of people on the side that they perceive themselves largely being against. If you're broadly skeptical of uh, police conduct, then you're going to see bad actions by police and you're going to say, yep, well, that makes sense to me. And uh, on the flip side, people who are broadly skeptical of of protest, uh, people who are broadly skeptical of uh, or view uh, protesters more broadly as having maybe a, a, a less than pure motives, uh, you're going to see the bad action, the looting, um, and uh, associated property damage, and you're going to say, "Yep, that's that's what that's what these people are like." This is why uh, leadership is extremely important for both activists and police departments. And uh, let me give you an example from the civil rights movement. Uh, one of the main um, uh, ideological bedrocks of the classical civil rights movement was an insistence on nonviolence. And they understood that they went to the South, they could get murdered. They understood that if they went on a free to ride, they might not come back. Yet the civil rights movement made it very clear from the beginning that shooting back and uh, harming other people was not the way they were going to deal with uh, violence. And there, it was a very similar issue where the people who committed violence were often community leaders in the South. Sometimes they were part of law enforcement. Uh, there's a document called Spies of Mississippi, which describes this kind of vast, elaborate system of repression that the Mississippi state government had set up in order to target civil rights activists. So in the civil rights era, it was no joke. You know, people did die. They were severely injured in many cases. Many of them did not come back. But there was uh, a great emphasis placed by the civil rights leadership to say, okay, we're going to train you for this. We're going to show you that if you look like you might be injured, this is what you should do. If somebody hurts you, this is what you're allowed to do. And they would have these training sessions and training camps and activism schools where they would train people so that they would reduce the chance that something really spiraled out of control. The same thing has to happen on, also on the side of law enforcement. They also have their own training. And apparently the training is not as effective as it could be. It may be failing. Maybe some police departments never went through it. Um, but what has to happen on the side of uh, police departments is they ought to also say, look, there are going to be people who are bad guys 
Um, and if you see somebody throwing a bowling ball through a window or a brick through a window, uh, that's clearly actionable. Uh, that probably does, that does not deserve uh, le lethal force. You're, you're allowed to restrain that person uh, with the least uh, damage possible. Uh, but apparently that's broken down. And uh, it's hard to tell what's fact from uh, the fog of war uh, through social media. But, you know, people are circulating uh, film clips of, um, for example, a police cruiser in Brooklyn literally driving through a crowd of uh, protesters. Um, there is, uh, I think, in your neck of the woods in Kentucky, there was a journalist who I think was shot with a rubber bullet. And uh, in the days to come, we'll get more context on whether those were accurate depictions of those events. But regardless, you know, it is on the shoulders of the police to say, I know beforehand I'm going to be in danger. So uh, we're also seeing some things on, on, you know, on the flip side. We're seeing a few police departments essentially uh, taking off their armor, uh, walking with protesters, trying to ingratiate themselves with uh, this movement and trying, it appears earnestly trying to understand what the grievances are. Uh, we're also seeing, uh, at least in Washington, D.C., uh, one video I saw circulated of a guy who was uh, essentially trying to chop up, the, chop up the sidewalk and uh, other protesters grabbing him and handing him over to the police. Right. And, you know, what you're going to see is um, we have a lot of protests in a lot of different cities and local conditions matter. So if you're in a police, you're in an area where the police department is a very combative um, stance towards the community, you're going to see a lot of bad incidents where people are going to be harmed or killed. If you're in a place where the police department has taken the effort to say, okay, I'm going to reach out and I'm going to really try to understand people, try to understand people, uh, then that's going to give you a different result, right? Uh, if you're in a community where people see themselves as the uh, caretakers of law and order, Right where they say, I can step in, and if I see somebody uh, torching a car, I can say, stop that. Don't do that. And these local conditions that you're talking about matter. And uh, you used the word uh, ingratiate. Uh, I'm not sure if that was the word you intended to use, but I want to push back just a little bit there to say uh, maybe it's a, a, we should uh, think, think about it as a search for understanding, that police officers can actually sit down and they can search for understanding. And uh, I can say from personal experience that the last couple of years, uh, you know, people have called the, the police on me twice in my own neighborhood. Uh, I'm, I, I don't think I'm threatening. I'm a tenured professor. I have gray hair. But yet my neighbors thought it was wise to call the police on me twice, in fact. And in fact, I wrote about one of those incidents on my personal blog. Uh, but, you know, I think what's really great is when a police officer says, what's your experience? You know, uh, we definitely want to get the bad guys, the people who may be stealing your cars or, you know, doing more horrible things. But, you know, why is it that uh, people are just walking around minding their own business and their neighbors call the police on them? And when the police take the effort to do that, uh, I think we should applaud that and we should encourage that and we should further the dialogue. So uh, there are institutional uh, impediments to either getting that kind of dialogue. Some of them are just laws. Uh, some of them are uh, l admitting liability, uh, especially for police departments. Uh, what are some of the things that you identify that, that are, I guess, keeping, keeping us separate in a way that uh, we you know, naturally shouldn't be? Right. And uh, that's a really great uh, question. And so the question boils down to what is the relationship between police departments and the rest of society? What is that relationship like? And uh, there are a couple of things to keep in mind, which is over time, police departments have increased in budget and size compared to, say, 50 or 100 years ago. They have more power than they used to have. Uh, so the courts and the federal governments have given local police uh, departments more power than they've had before. Uh, given what happened, uh, you know, uh, in cases like Aaron Garner, or Tamir Rice, or or, uh, or George Floyd, you know, questions about uh, qualified immunity, like legal doctrines that really enable police uh, to be on a separate pedestal than the rest of us. There's also culture. We can also ask, you know, culturally, when people join police departments, what do they believe the rest of the world to be like? So, for example, in some circles, people say things there's like there's a war on police. I always find this puzzling 
uh, in the, not because policing is not dangerous. Policing is clearly dangerous. However, uh, you know, most people I know like the police. They respect the police. Maybe they think they're maybe they think they're uh, there might be a, too big of a budget for them, or there are too many police. But nobody has a, very few people have ill will towards the police per se. Um, so uh, there's a cultural thing that happens where uh, some people in law enforcement really do believe they're in a combative stance with the rest of the community. And then we could also think about formal institutions. So, for example, uh, one uh, common uh, reform proposal that's often floated is to have more, uh, you know, community-oriented uh, interactions with police, where there might be boards or uh, a regularized place where people can come and meet and talk to the police and meet them face to face. Uh, that's supposed to have an informal effect, where pe once you get to know somebody as a person, you don't see them as a victim or as a target anymore. But also, it could be more formal in the sense of, okay, there's a place where I can go to to talk about the police and complain about them. That's not the police department. And so, I think, uh, you know, if you were to randomly pick a, a police department in the country, randomly pick an officer, they're probably an okay person who does a, a fine job. But um, Definitely, when you have a lot of these issues where uh, there is a, a skeptical attitude towards uh, the population, uh, sometimes you'll see news reports about people with very bad uh, attitudes towards minorities seeking out jobs in law enforcement. You'll see cases uh, where police officers are hired and rehired even after they have a, a series of complaints lodged against them that are very plausible complaints. All these things build up and accrue over time. And that creates a shift and that starts creating that barrier between law enforcement and the rest of society. There are hundreds of millions of Americans who uh, I assume have watched uh, these events unfold in many cities and have th have thought to themselves, look, there's there are clearly some problems here on, on both sides. Um, it's kind of weird to think that the, the, the most sane voice on all of this so far that I've heard speak at length is killer Mike. Um, but when, when you, uh, uh, you know, observe all this and the, this, the, what seem to be intractable, uh, problems that have been so consistent over so many years, uh, with respect to protest and police abuse, um, well, what do you think if there is a solution, what do you think it is? Well, I may be a little bit more optimistic than you. Uh, because when I look at history, there are lots of problems that seemed impossible or intractable. Uh, in American history, you know, probably our worst problem was slavery, uh, and uh, that that was uh, solved. Um, it, it was solved in a very painful way through the Civil War, but was solved. We also had Jim Crow and segregation. Thankfully, that was solved without quite the loss of life that we had during the Civil War. Uh, we can look across the world at apartheid communism, socialism, and we see that those systems change. Uh, They're not forever. So uh, the first thing I would do is think about vision. And it may sound like a platitude or an empty statement, but that's not the case. All things that change start with a vision. But then the next step is to really think concretely about exactly how to translate that vision into what you can actually do. And of course, most of us are not going to become social activists. Uh, that's not something that most people are going to do. We have our everyday lives. But there are uh, lots of simple things that people could do. So, for example, if you um, you know see your um, local police department doing something bad, call your city councilman and complain. To say, on the street the other day, I saw something that I thought was uh, very poor, very poor behavior. Or if you see a police officer treating somebody extremely well, praise that. You know, Encourage good behavior and bad behavior. Then a smaller number of us may decide that social activism is something we want to do. And then we would uh, open dialogues with police departments. And that's one of the things that I think uh, was very valuable about Black Lives Matter when it appeared on the scene about six years ago, which is in a number of cities, they have actually tried to um, open up discussions with police departments um, in order to really actually get real policies. And they're not going to they're not going to change everything overnight, but this is how change happens. Little by little, you just go to city by city, police department by police department and say, look, here's a concrete issue. What are you going to do? What can you do? And it's not glamorous. You're not going to get on TV. Uh, you're not going to get a million followers on Twitter, but you can make your town or your neighborhood a little bit better by reaching out. 
in a lot of protest movements, uh, you know, as as you alluded to, the organizers are very clear to say, look, we can't give uh, these authorities any reason to uh, work against us, to paint us as some particular uh, flavor of protest, as violent people. Um, and at the same time, I I do think that in some cases of injustice, particularly systemic injustice, it's hard to say that violence cannot be justified. Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, sociologists and political scientists have asked themselves the question, what tactics work? Is violence a tactic that actually gets you what you want? And uh, this discussion has gone on for decades. And uh, little by little, a uh, picture seems to be emerging, which is on the average, uh, violent tactics are actually counterproductive. This doesn't mean that you can't look through history and can find one case or some cases where violence seems to result in what you want. But uh, in social science, you don't cherry pick one answer. You look at the entire body of data. And in uh, a number of studies, people have asked the question, what kinds of protests lead to you getting what you want? And uh, the answer in recent years has been actually violence does not pay off in the end. Uh, in my own research, for example, I studied student activism. And I studied the uh, Black Studies movement of the 1960s, and I asked the question, when does student protest actually lead to the creation of a Black Studies program? So it was an attempt to diversify the curriculum. And uh, I went through newspapers and found examples of, uh, of Black student protest, and those were coded for whether they were violent or nonviolent or disruptive. That's why I called it in the published version of that study. And disruptive protests statistically were no different than not doing anything at all. And nonviolent protests were actually more likely to uh, get you a, a program. A new paper by a scholar, a prince named Omar, Omar Wasau, which is coming out in the American Political Science Review, uses uh, riot, riot data from the 1960s and asks, when, does bla when do black riots correlate or increase the Richard Nixon vote? And for those of you who were not born during the time of Richard Nixon, some of you younger people listening to this podcast, but Richard Nixon was seen as the quote unquote law and order candidate who was seen as really exploiting racial antagonism and often, frankly, bluntly uh, pursuing an anti-black agenda. So more of a Nixon vote is not what you want if you're for racial justice. And what uh, Professor Wasau at Princeton found uh, was that when you had more black rights, you got more of a Nixon vote in that area. So uh, there are many uh, cases where uh, violent protest uh, does not get you what you want. And you could ask the question, why is that? Well, my belief, uh, and I cover this in my book on black studies, when I actually studied university administrations and their response to protest, is that when you turn to violence, you allow the other side to paint you in a bad light or put you in a bad light. It allows the other guys to say, look, these guys are unreasonable. Don't listen to them. And it makes it hard for your friends to advocate for you because getting back to the issue of police violence, police violence is not going to change just because of protest. It'll change because protest triggers a relationship. Protest will lead to white people looking at the issue and saying, hey, there's something that's not right there. That's really unfair. And you need to get some people on your side. Protest doesn't mean that you need to get everybody on your side, but you need to get somebody on your side. And the more violent you become, the harder it is for these people to come out of the shadows, the timid people to get off the bench and come and help you out as you lobby the police department for a new set of rules. So uh, to answer your question, uh, my belief after having studied this and reading the uh, scholarly literature on it, which is that, yeah, there are cases where violence does seem to attract attention and whatnot. But when you look at the entire body of evidence, it's actually counterproductive. Fabio Rojas is a sociologist at Indiana University. He is the author of From Black Power to Black Studies, How a Radical Social Movement Became an Academic Discipline. Subscribe to the Cato Daily Podcast wherever you please and follow us on Twitter at Cato Podcast. 